Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He is the founder of Onnit. He's a New York Times bestselling author of Own the Day. He's the host of AMP or Audrey, Aubrey Marcus podcast. He's the creator of the Fit for Service app, which we will get into. He optimizes optimizing for optimization. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> welcome to the stage, Aubrey Marcus. What's up, everybody? Good to be here. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming on. Um, why mm -hmm. do you think that uh, that human beings are here slash exist? Hmm. Coming out of the gates hot. I like yeah. it. Uh, okay. So <clears throat> I believe that we are an inextricable part of the earth. And in my own belief, we are actually connected to the earth like an entire organism, much like our own body, which has bacteria and viruses and funguses, the microbiome, the microbiome, the you know, the virome, all of these things living within us, as well as differentiated cells and different functions. But we're one person. Yeah, I'm Aubrey, ish, Aubrey, with all of my other things. So too, can you look at the earth as one conscious planet? Now, the consciousness is not the same consciousness that we have, you have to look at a different spiritual dimensionality, which is my own personal belief. But either way, I think my belief still makes makes sense about why we're here. So we evolve as part of the earth, come up from the earth. And in some ways we are like the neural network of the earth. We're the ability to become self-aware, the ability to create technology. And still, of course, although we've forgotten, we are always connected to the earth. No matter how hard we try, we're, we come from her and we're going back there. Like whether we put ourselves in a box or we burn ourselves into the air and then it falls back down or we cryo freeze ourselves until we're a fucking thought out stake 200 years from now. I don't give a shit. We're going back. We're going back home no matter what we do. I believe that our purpose here is to develop technology. And I believe that this is part of what we're meant to do so that when that next big cataclysm comes like that next giant meteor that's going to come and wipe out all life or most of all life like it has many times before which is probably what ended the reign of the dinosaurs and has happened multiple times throughout our history that we could actually prevent that from happening and prevent the earth from having to go through one of those cataclysmic resets now it's a dangerous game because we are also quite possibly going to create the cataclysm. But I actually think that us in conjunction with the earth, like we knew that this was the dangerous game that we were gonna play to try and create life that could actually protect and shepherd all life from the existential threats of the universe. We just haven't figured out that that's our purpose. And in the meantime, we're busy destroying the earth. Um, but I think my belief is that was a game that she was willing to play because you know, ultimately, we're all on team life. We all need all of the life to flourish. And we're the only species that has the ability to protect the earth from total cataclysmic end. Of course, it would restart at a certain point. But uh, but that takes a long time, potentially millions of years. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Do you think that uh, that that is by design by by Mother Nature? Or do you think, like, from a religious standpoint, what kind of what is your perspective on that? You know, I, I, I believe, um, you know, religion is a tough word just because there's very well-defined religions that I don't really agree with most yeah. of the doctrines of, but from a spiritual perspective, yeah, from a spiritual perspective, I've recently come around to the belief that this was an intentional and conscious, a conscious co-creation with, with the earth and the earth knew that in, in helping to create us that we would have ultimately turn against her and get obsessed with technology and all of this machinery. But that obsession with technology and even the technology being driven by war, being driven by all of these other ways in which we would use it against each other and against her would ultimately give us the 
impetus to create the technology that could actually save her and yeah. save all of us. There's a, a strange irony to that, no, no doubt about it. Was there a, a light switch moment for you recently that, that led you to, to switch that belief? It was actually, uh, so my wife, Vailana Marcus, is a fucking badass, and I love her so much. And she's a, she's a true medicine woman, like in every sense of the word. And she was in ceremony. We do quite a bit of psychedelic plant medicine ceremonies, and she was in a ceremony. And she got that communication um, from Mother Earth. And that really resonated with me. I was like, oh, yeah. Like, maybe she's been in on the game the whole time. Maybe it's not like us making a mistake. Maybe she knew that it had to be this way. And she was willing to bear the risk. Because when that, when that meteor hit her, you know, 65 million years ago in the Yucatan Peninsula or wherever it was, when that meteor hit her, that fucking hurt. You know, that was like a bullet to the ribs, you know? And she was like, all right, enough of this gigantic creatures that can't do anything and just have to fucking <laughs> die. Like, let's yeah. make some smart fuckers. Yeah. And what? maybe they can save us from this. Yeah. Boy, the double-edged sword associated with that, huh? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's a fascinating perspective. I've never, uh, I've never heard that nor, nor thought of that. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Um, I, I have, I would say recently, come across some folks with theories about, uh, you know, whether or not humans are actually aliens, you know, that mm -hmm. people, you know, you hear about our aliens real and, and all this stuff, but that, that, you know, the, the DNA and the, the advancement of, of what human brain beings are capable of and what they bring to the table, uh, you know, planetary wise is that it, it only makes sense that, some material from, you know, an asteroid or meteor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, millions of years ago or, or, you know, whenever basically created human beings, uh, in that way. Do you, have you heard that? Do you, do you hold any credence to that? I've heard that expressed in a lot of different ways. Um, this is where it starts getting like just pure conjecture for me, <clears throat> but, uh, in my <clears throat> conjecture, I believe that the earth is part of uh part of a network of conscious life-giving planets with life you know with living beings and i think some of these these beings are not operating under the same rules that we are and you know the same 3d matter that we experience life in but nonetheless i think they all have you know <clears throat> whatever their properties and whatever their nature, I think that it is quite possible that these other beings were in cahoots with the earth potentially and almost accelerating the development of humans so that yeah. we could make it, we could make it to technological advancement fast enough to actually prevent the next cataclysm and actually offer up a conscious race of beings to yeah. enter into more of like a, galactic federation the united nation of beings but i don't fucking know i mean yeah. that's just an idea that uh that i think is is interesting yeah. um and could be true or it could could not be true but i find it hard to believe that we would be the only life affirming planet in the entire yeah I, that doesn't make a lot of sense no i agree i, I mean I, you know i'm not a an astronaut nor a, a scientist of any kind but i you know I, i've seen enough kind of you know, data that, that speaks to mathematically, it's basically impossible for there not to be, you know, at, at some, right. at some point in the universe. And and I also find, I would say equally fascinating is that the kind of the, the relationship or the parallels between like neural pathways inside our brains and, and how that mapping or, or the, the structural organization of that mimics a lot of, of solar systems and, and basically the way that mm -hmm. the universe is laid out and then going all the way down to like a cellular level, like it's all kind of structured the same. It's just an order of magnitude based on size. And, and to me, that's, if anything, probably the most um, realistic, uh, you know, reasoning behind why there's probably other, other planets out there that have some sort sure. of life on them. But uh, it's all, all fascinating stuff. I mean, we could probably spend uh, the entire podcast talking about uh, aliens and, <laughs> and life forms. But, uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, the principle that you're talking about was an old, you know, alchemical principle from Hermes Trismegistus, and it was summed up as as above, so below. 
as yeah. within, so without. You know, there's this kind of mimicry of the finite detail of an atom and then the way that planets, you know, circle the sun, you know, the way yeah. that electrons circle the nucleus and the way that planets circle the sun. And it's like, it's very, very interesting how the inner mirrors the outer. Yeah. Well, and I think, uh, you know, the, you know, again, the, the, the element of, of those parallels that exist. It's like if, if it can be on, on such a, a microcosm and go all the way to, to the macrocosm, there's obviously a, um, almost, I mean, I don't know if there's a term for like the opposite of the chaos theory, but almost a predictability there that, mm -hmm. that would, uh, you know, lend itself to say it, it kind of has to be there. There has to be other, you know, solar systems that, that are set up basically exactly like ours, you know, it's, it's sure. really, really interesting stuff, but, um, what, what is the closest near death experience that you've had? <laughs> It was probably the car accident that I got in about four years ago. And uh, I actually posted some some images of that and wrote a little blog post about it. If anybody wants to Google my name and car <clears throat> accident, you'll see a pretty mangled car and a pretty mangled face. A very strange set of circumstances. Middle of the day, middle of the week, leaving my house, you know, had a sparkling water in my cup holder, spin drift, my favorite sparkle drink. And I was going to the office. I was going to do a podcast with the musician, Nako. And uh, <clears throat> remember leaving my gate. And then the next memory I have was the jaws of life. Oh, cracking, sure. cracking, the, you know, cracking the roof of my car wow. and trying to pull me out. And presumably what happened, there was no skid marks or anything. So I, I went unconscious. And I pushed my foot down on the accelerator and accelerated into a guardrail. The guardrail malfunctioned and part of it bent back around and pierced through the side of the car and the window. And then it ended up like slicing through, like pulled my nose kind of off my face, sliced down the side, sliced through my lip, and then sliced like into my neck uh, as well. So all of that... Um, and it was very interesting. So once the jaws of life, everything was still blurry. I was still kind of in and out of consciousness. And then, uh, you know, in the hospital, um, I remember, <clears throat> I remember like they asked me who I wanted to call and, and I called my fiance at the time, Whitney. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a very wild experience because I didn't have any fear because I don't remember it happening. So like people ask me about like, do you have trauma? Was it hard to get in the same car? I was like, no, I bought the same car and got the same wrap on it, the same color. Like what I don't have, it? I didn't have, it, it was a Tesla. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I didn't have any memory of the experience other than the experience of waking up in the hospital and, mm -hmm. and hearing the jaws of life. Um, but I had this strange, I had this strange mindset that came over me that was, as soon as I woke up, you know, I just knew that this happened for me, not to me. And I just didn't know why. And it was like, this happened for me. I just don't know why yet. And I had this unshakable faith. And it's not like I always have that, you know, I'll get a nose cold and I'll be like, curse the gods, Odin, why have you forsaken me? You know, but, <laughs> but like in this moment when it really mattered, you know, my, my mindset was just so like, so dialed and, um, you know, my only sentiment was like, I was just sorry to the people who had to take care of, take care of me. You know, I yeah. feel like I let, I let my friends and family and loved ones down. Of course, that was probably an insight, uh, as to one of the reasons why it happened for me was to wake me up to the reality that I was doing too much for other people and that it was okay to be cared for. And it was okay to let other people take care of me. That's a, that's a fascinating perspective. Was, uh, was there a, an element medically that, that they could explain what happened? They ran all the tests, all the EKGs, EEGs, all of the different things and couldn't find anything. It wow. was, it, and I'm, and I'm also like very resistant to going unconscious, right? Yeah. Like I've, I've been in martial arts a lot of my life and taken a lot of hard hits to the head. Um, 
I've drank way too much alcohol and done way too many things that I should, that I should do, but I never have lost consciousness nor memory. Wow. And like this idea of blacking out, like, I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Like I've remembered everything, even as hard as I've tried to, you know, to put myself in a situation where, uh, I was compromising my consciousness. I'm tenacious with my consciousness. So it was a very, very strange thing. It was somehow like the universe just switched off the lights. Yeah. So you're the guy that can't, uh, that Tim Kennedy can't get the blood joke on. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I'm sure he could. <laughs> I'm sure he could. We'll have to, we'll have to sure ask him could. about that. Uh, yeah. I'd rather not. Yeah. I'll um, give him credit. I, I think yeah, he can do it. Yeah. Um, in terms of the the recovery time, how long did it take you to get back to physically, basically, where where you uh, felt recovered? Well, the big danger of it was that <clears throat> the, I mean, there was a lot of superficial damage. I have some dead teeth. And of course, you know, my nose still has like tingling scars. And so there's a lot of superficial damage, a lot of blood, but I had a good surgeon in there. The one that was like right here on, I think it's on this side. I don't even remember. Uh, right here on my neck. Um, that was close. Obviously, there's, and you mentioned the blood choke. There's a lot of arteries that run along the side of the throat here. And if that would have cut a little deeper, um, that might have been the end. That might have yeah. been the end. But nonetheless, other than that, the Tesla's a great fucking car. Yeah. And I was obviously completely relaxed, which is how you should be you know, to prevent the whiplash and to prevent all of the other kind of issues. So I didn't have a lot of <clears throat> other kind of major damage, not even any kind of traumatic brain injury wow. that came from it. It was really just the guardrail that cut. So I was actually, and this is also somewhat foolish, but I'll explain why I did this. So I was actually at Burning Man uh, two weeks after my car accident. Really? <laughs> and my face was fucking mangled. And I looked yeah. like I was, uh, I looked like, you know, the guy from Goonies. What was his yeah. name? Uh, uh, Snickers? Sloth? No, Baby Ruth. Yeah, Sloth. Sloth. Yeah. Sloth. Yeah. Yeah, I looked like Sloth from Goonies, but I was there at Burning Man. <laughs> and and uh, the reason why I went to Burning Man that year is, so I was in a polyamorous relationship with, uh, with Whitney at the time. And she had two of her boyfriends going to Burning Man. And I just knew that if I was staying at home by myself yeah. and my fiance was out there with both of her boyfriends on the playa, yeah. I knew I just couldn't fucking handle it. So I was yeah. like, all right, fucking, I'm going to, I'm going to be there. I'm going to go. Yeah. Cause the, the, the hardest part about that whole, that whole journey is the imagination that your mind has. Like reality yeah. is never as bad as what you imagine it to be. Sure. So I knew if I was there in reality, uh, it wouldn't be as bad, but it ended up being really bad anyways. She yeah. fell in love out there regardless, yeah. probably because I was walking around looking like fucking yeah. baby Ruth out there on the playa and what some the... handsome, some handsome lad came and swooped in and stole her heart. Yeah. So, so she was there with two, two of her boyfriends. Yeah. Did she to be fall fair, in love with I was one there of them? With, to be fair, I was there with two of my girlfriends too. Okay. So, so this was the, this two... is the game. Yeah. So each of you had yeah. two other. Yeah. And they, and all four of them knew the deal. Everybody knows, yeah. everybody knew the deal. That was the, that was the redeeming part of our whole arrangement. Yeah. Radical honesty. Yeah. Everybody was absolutely, everybody knew each other. Everybody talked to each other. Everybody like, everybody knew the deal and, uh, it was really <laughs> hard, but at least it was honest. And, yeah. um, so, so it, that it, was, that was good. Is the hard part purely the emotional jealousy or, or the jealousy of, of potential emotional connection or, or was the, uh, the combination of physical and emotional physical and emotional. Yeah. I think, I mean, one harder than the I other. can't both were hard. Yeah. Both were fucking hard. I think, um, cause I experienced like extremes on both end, you know, I experienced at that very, at that time at Burning Man, she had one boyfriend there who was like a particularly strong physical connection and you know, he was a pretty aggressive guy and that was fucking brutal. I hated that. Yeah. I fucking hated it. And then there was this other guy who was a really good guy, actually, like really like kind and like, and sweet guy, but she was emotionally like in love with him. Mm -hmm. So both were fucking brutal and it was just like different flavors of torture, you yeah. know, like what's your pick your, pick your cool. pain. But really it's the, it's the idea that, um, somehow they love somebody else more than you. And, and that's the, that's the kind of the, the root of it. Yeah. Um, 
and and you feel like you need that that love and that validation that you're the best and that you're the most important and that you're number one and you need that kind of constant reassurance that you are and sure. uh, and always looking for evidence why you're not yeah like and I never was able to quite get out of that trap yeah so I wonder if uh, from your perspective if you think that that ego plays a role or played a role in that in that there was a concern that maybe they would they would be better than you was there Fuck any of yeah that? of course yeah. it did of yeah. course it did i remember she uh her the first guy that she started seeing was a professional fighter oh, okay. and and i thought to myself I, as soon as she started dating him i just went to the gym and i was training like six days a week <laughs> i'm gonna fuck him up <laughs> <laughs> i was like oh she likes fighters i'm gonna i'm gonna be a great fighter and then yeah. I, at a certain point after two weeks of that i'm like what the fuck are you doing man first of all you're never going to be anywhere near as good as this fucking guy. Yeah. Second of all, that's not why she loves you. She loves yeah. you for being Aubrey, yeah. not for being a fucking fighter. You know, you can't compare yourself in that sure. way. So that makes me wonder then, do you, do you think that um, there is a genetic hardwiring of, of that from a um, survivability of a species standpoint? There, there's a, a competitive genetic code that's ingrained in us to, to feel that way. You know, I was I was just recently talking to Brett Weinstein and read his book, A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. And he really blurs the lines between genetic and cultural. He's basically making the argument that culture is reflecting the epigen and, and kind of generating the epigenetic switches of the time. Yeah. So while we like to think, is it genetic or is it cultural as different things? He's like, nah. Nah, fam. Like both of those are the same thing. The culture is actually working with the epigenetic switches to create a situation because there's plenty of examples of different cultures around the world that do not present with that type of jealousy. Like even the word, you know, Eskimo brother, and I don't think we're supposed to call people Eskimos these days, <laughs> but, but ultimately the word Eskimo brother is yeah. your Eskimo brother is a person who's had sex with the same woman as you. Yeah. Well, that comes from the idea that in their culture, the chief would let guests of honor sleep with his wife, right? And that was like what the chief did as the greatest sign of being an honored guest. And then yeah. there's cultures in Africa where all of the men go out and, and walk their animals out on the land. And then they leave one man behind and it's his job to service all the women. And then there's Tahitian cultures where when somebody's sick, they go in the room and, and where other people are making making love and having sex. And there's like, there's all kinds of different cultural examples where that doesn't exist and it and it seems like culture and genetic epigenetic triggers and epigenetics being far more important than genetics are actually weaving together so i think that culturally we are not in the culture that makes it easy for us to escape the jealousy yeah. and the kind of ego strength that um that would allow polyamory to be a a, a effective solution. It's just really fucking hard. Yeah. I mean, it's, that certainly makes sense. I guess the, you know, where, where my curiosity kind of <clears throat> snowballs is thinking of it from a, a mammal standpoint mm -hmm. is that, you know, we're mammals the same way all the rest of them are uh, with one, obviously huge exception in terms of, of verbal language and, and our brains being what they are. But if you look at, um, you know, really any other species of mammals and, and their procreation habits tend to lend themselves to that like super competitive, whether you, I don't know that you'd call it jealousy. I think that's anthropomorphizing, but, but it's, it's woven sure. into the fabric of their, of their genetic code to, to out fuck everything else, you know? Uh, and, <laughs> yeah. and so like, I, I wonder, or I, I, I guess I would think that there at least has to be some of that that's woven into our, our being that way. So I believe that I believe that for my whole life up until I read the book, uh, sex at dawn by Dr. Chris Ryan, yeah. I read sex at dawn. And cause I had a, you know, I had a partnership with a amazing woman who's my best friend. Her name's Caitlin Howe and we were engaged and you know, we would have, we would have threesomes with other women, but I would never like never let any man even see her naked. Right. Yeah. Like she could be free and dance and wear crazy costumes and whatever. I'm not like a, jealous controlling type by any stretch of the imagination but like the her her nakedness and her sexuality like no men 
no men were allowed anywhere near that. And I yeah. justified that by saying like, yeah, it's like a lion or a fucking a bull or like it's, you know, I looked at some of these other animal examples, but then I read Sex at Dawn and realized that actually the animals that are closest in consciousness to humans, which are bonobos, which are slightly more, slightly closer in consciousness to humans than other chimpanzees and dolphins have much different rules surrounding their, their sexuality, right? Like they will actually have sex with each other to resolve conflict. There's, you know, multiple different partners. There's different lesbian, they'll, they'll be lesbian. They'll be like, they'll, they're ex much, much more expanded kind of fluid understanding of sexuality. So while I definitely feel like there's some remnants of the old lion and the old bull inside of us, there's also a hell of a lot more bonobo, which we share like 98 point something percent of our yeah. DNA with. Um, so I think there's both, but what I really think is, is that the culture, the culture is, and the consciousness of our time is still very much so in that, that kind of lion consciousness. Yeah. And, um, uh, until we evolve past the lion consciousness, we're going to be fighting against our own epigenetics. And look, I mean, I'm a, I consider myself a really conscious dude. I have all the tools in the world, you know, and I, I got beat, I got beat by polyamory. Like it was better than I was. Yeah. You know, so, so, and after eight years, like it kicked my ass and wow. I just fucking finally w waved the, the white flag and was like, you win, you know, so it was it like a huge, huge relief when you said, I can't fucking do it anymore. Like it was a, a, a spiritual awakening almost that way. <laughs> no, I mean, I actually probably gave myself two credits. So let's rewind the tape <laughs> and let me remove the amount of credit that I gave myself because quite Honestly, what happened was, is I met, well, I didn't meet her, but I had the opportunity to be with my wife and my wife didn't want any part to do with polyamory. I was pretty much done with polyamory, but I'd gotten past the worst of it. I was still pretty wounded, but I'd gotten past the worst of it. And I probably would have stuck around in it, to be honest. Had you I probably would have lingered around in it. It was honest, you know, like I'd, I'd worked through most of the pitfalls. I was pretty addicted to the people who I was seeing. Um, but when I had the chance to be with Filana, you know, that was kind of my way out. So in some ways, um, in some ways that connection that I had with her pulled me out of that old system, which really wasn't serving me, but I also wasn't able to, you know, wasn't able to extract myself because I yeah. kind of made it through the worst of the hell and it was a lot of fun. And I was actually finally starting to enjoy myself a little bit more than I was over the past few years. Yeah. I feel bad for my audience because for like four years, I would just talk about the fucking torture <laughs> that I was in. And they're like, stop talking about it already. Yeah. Just do yeah. something else. I'm yeah. like, I can't. Yeah. That's a trip. Did you read sex at dawn while you were engaged to the girl that you were having female threesome? Yeah. With? So did, yeah, did, did I that, did. it was, like, did that open the door to now threesomes with guys? <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> you know, what it opened the door to was I don't particularly like the threesomes with guys thing. It's just not the flavor of thing that I like. I don't like, I don't like, I never liked it when I was watching porn, you know, like that wasn't my thing. I would much prefer like put as many girls as you want in the room, but like, yeah. I didn't really need like a bunch of guys yeah. and one girl. That was never really my thing. So um, only one but what it did open pasture for a reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> there was a, uh, but it did open me up to the idea that, you know, women, just like men have sexual desires and sexual needs. And that there's, if you don't have the skill and technology to overcome it in the aggregate, there will be a waning of passion that happens starting at about two years and a waning of passion. And what happens is for men, the passion gradually declines and for women, it kind of falls off a cliff. And this was actually talked about even more in Dr. Wednesday Martin's book, Untrue. And she just shows that, look, it, in the aggregate, this is what happens. And so really what gets, and this is one of the reasons why people cheat so much, is that those new relationships, they call it limerence. There's this intoxication of fullness of presence. And this like, you don't care about your phone. You don't care about anything. It's like you're right there in the moment, just like you were when you first, first got with your partner. And then the novelty can spark that. Like novelty is an engine to spark that. So unless you have the, the skill and training and understanding about how to create ever deepening levels of novelty, novelty at depth mm -hmm. with your existing partner, 
you're going to be in an absence of passion, an absence of eros, which is another word for like the erotic passion of presence. You're going to have an absence of that and you're going to have to make some decisions. And, you know, if you permit me to continue on this rant, the decisions you make when you have this absence of passion are, there's a couple decisions. One, you just fucking resign and say like, fuck it. Like, I'm not going to have passion anymore. That's fine. I'm in this kind of part interesting partnership with my wife and we'll raise kids and we'll handle shit. But this no. part of my life is done. And then from there, you can either find passion in something else, like maybe hunting or maybe fucking woodworking or maybe golf or whatever. You find like an eroticism in the activity of doing something else. And that kind of fulfills you or you cheat, you know, and find, find your kind of passionate eros in, in that manner, in that kind of transgressive way, or you find the technology and the understanding to actually deepen that with your partner. And, um, so I think those are the options that you're faced with when, uh, when that passion starts to wane. Yeah. So in essence, or in summary, I guess the two year magic, magic, uh, time frame mark that goes away and, and it's a human, uh, whether you want to call it a primary reinforcer, a need, uh, for yep. human beings to have that. And so they're, they're going to find it somewhere. They're going to reconnect with the existing, put it into some other passion or find it somewhere else. Yeah. 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 I mean, that makes perfect sense. What was the name of that book? Untrue. 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 Yeah. That's fascinating. Wednesday, Martin. Uh, it sounds like you, uh, read a shitload. I read quite a bit. Yeah. Do you watch I mean, any I'm, TV, I'm a... like any garbage TV that you're, you're almost <laughs> embarrassed to admit that you watch? No, I, I do watch, I do watch some shows. Like I'll give shows a chance. Like, um, the most recent show that I really like was a show Witcher. Yeah. Uh, Witcher is fucking great. Yeah. I watched, um, uh, the last kingdom. Oh with, yeah. Uh, that's a fucking great, yeah. great show. Uhtred, that's yeah. fucking great show. <laughs> like a fucking you're great a Game show. of Thrones fan. I was a Game of Thrones yeah. guy. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, so there's stuff like that. There's a show C on uh, Apple TV Plus, which with Jason Momoa. Yeah. And, um, and that other uh, giant fucker, what's his name? The wrestler. Um, yeah, I know who you're talking about. I can't think of his name. There's, yeah. there's another show that's, that's kind of similar in, in that same uh, that you, you may like if you haven't seen it. Snowpiercer. I don't know if you're familiar no. with that. Yeah, so it's got uh, the guy from, it's got Ned Stark from, from Game of Thrones. He's one nice. of the characters in it. And it's basically like this kind of post-apocalypse uh, where human beings have, have heated the earth to the point where now they, they do all this whiz-bang shit, kind of like the GMO mosquitoes that you were bitching about uh, on <laughs> social media, which I'd love to talk about that. But kind of yeah. similarly, it's like it's an overcorrection to the point where it, it does damage, kind of like oversteering right. in a fucking car. But is that, okay, the planet's heating, it's heating, it's heating. So all these, you know, big brain scientists decide we're going to do X, Y, and Z to cool the earth off. And now it cools it to the point where it's like negative 190 degrees on, on the face of the earth everywhere. And there's, <laughs> and there's like uh, very few people alive. And there's this like self-regenerating thousand car long train that never stops. And, and basically the, the fact that it doesn't stop is what their survivability on this train hinges on. And so like they're uh -huh. growing their own food. There's a fucking prison system. Like it's a, it's a city. It's like an aircraft carrier, but in wow. train cars wow. that just has to keep going. There's two seasons. I, I've watched both of them. It's actually pretty, uh, pretty interesting and, and a neat, cool. uh, neat show. But anyway, um, that, but that's, yeah. So that's exactly like, that's exactly, I'll get, I'll get on a, I'll get on one of these shows <clears throat> and I have very little self-restraint when I'm yeah. on one of these shows. Like yeah. they last about three days and everything yeah. else, my whole <laughs> schedule gets fucked yeah. and it's like. I'm into it. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. Yeah. Uh, that's funny <laughs> shit. Um, all right. Uh, sw switching gears a little bit. Uh, if you had to pinpoint the hardest business lesson that you have, have learned, what would that be? And is there one? I know there's a lot. Mm. But... Well, the hardest business moment, let's talk about that. And uh, cause hard lesson you know, a lesson that's been difficult to learn. I could talk about that, but let me talk about the hardest moment. The hardest moment was at a point where I was going to finally <laughs> take an investor into on it. And it was a venture capital firm and they were going to invest like 25 million into on it. And this was 2017, um, which coincided with also the most difficult time in my life for a lot of reasons. It was my car accident. It was 
the breakup of a very important friendship that I had. It was um, very difficult. All of those things I mentioned with the polyamory that were very fucking difficult. And simultaneously, uh, we were on the basically the one yard line of closing this deal, this investment deal. And right at the last moment, some shit with the paperwork and some shit within within our company and their company didn't line up and we pulled out of the deal and and had to pull out of the deal basically like our hand was forced and but at that point we had distributed because it was the one yard line we had already distributed all of our cash oh, so wow. like all of the cash we had in our bank was distributed to all the owners. So I had, I had a good amount of cash in my own bank account, but the company had nothing. And <laughs> then the investment, we were supposed to get this $20 million that didn't come through. So all of a sudden we have all of these accounts payable. Obviously we're still selling product. We have all of these accounts payable that are far exceeding the cash we have on hand. And we had just hired a new CFO then. And he just, he walks into the room when this happens, we're all having a big like key chief meeting. He walks into the room and he says, look, you guys are going to be bankrupt in, you know, six weeks. Here's the chart. Uh, there's no way out and I'm out of here. Oh, and he just yeah. fucking walked out. He just walked oh, out. This was the CFO. Uh, this was the CFO. Yeah. <laughs> and so we were like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. First of all, what a fucking snowflake <laughs> you know like come on like way to fucking way to give tough up it out when right, times yeah. get hard yeah the last guy you would ever want with you in a in a platoon but uh but ultimately like we just had to we called it cash apocalypse and we just had to work every relationship we had you know put in personal money loan do whatever we could to like keep this thing afloat and uh but it was it was the point where it felt like everything we had built might actually collapse in on itself because oh. of, you know, the mistakes that we'd made. And looking back, you know, it was, I kind of left way too much paperwork to the lawyers. I didn't read through all of the details. I trusted people who I shouldn't have trusted, especially on the, on the legal side. Um, there was a lot of different things I could have looked at that would have prevented that, but it was, it was a really, really tough moment. But ultimately I think what saved us was that we treated everybody really, really well. Yeah. throughout our entire entire history so all of our vendors everybody they trusted us they believed in us they're like all right you know i know that we usually give you net 30 we'll give you net 90 or net 120 you know like you'll have enough time to pay this back we trust you we believe in you and thanks oh, for always awesome. being you know being honest with us and and so i think all of our relationships all of our goodwill ended up saving us yeah. and uh and that was like an important lesson to learn is that you don't you don't know when you're going to need to call on support yeah. And if you always treat people right, uh, when that time comes, you're going to be in good shape. Well, yeah. that's, that's awesome to hear. I mean, it's uh, one of those things that obviously you get through it and now you know, probably gives you that air of confidence that like, if I can get through that fucking, there, there's nothing yeah. that's, that's going to stop us. But, uh, but it also, right. I think speaks volumes to the, the importance of how you treat everybody, you know, irrespective of, of where they're at in the hierarchy of, of, no doubt. Um, everything really is that, you know, treat everybody the, the same, uh, which is, you know, how you'd want to be treated, which uh, that's awesome. Even people that, <clears throat> even people that you're terminating, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and to talk about terminating, there's, there's a couple of lessons that I think are important about hiring and firing. Um, there's a saying that I love, it's better to have a hole than an asshole. Right. <laughs> so like, it's better to have like a, an empty spot in yeah. your company than to fill it with somebody who isn't of the right integrity and yeah. isn't of the right skill set. Yeah. And uh, I've also, you know, there's never been anybody that I've fired and been like, ah, that was too soon. Should have kept yeah. them around. Yeah. You know, like by the time you fire them, you're always too late. Yeah. You know, so like when you know, like it's tough. And then also, as you mentioned, Ned Stark, like another big important thing is, is that if you're going to terminate someone, if you're responsible for making that decision, you better be in that fucking meeting. Yeah. You know, you better be the one that's expressing it, looking them in the eye and telling them the truth and giving them that honor and that respect. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's really important. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. It's a, a absolutely good, good lessons learned or lessons gone through, I guess, as you put it. Um, what is your, your normal morning routine? Let's say the first two hours of every morning when you're in town and it's kind of a, as normal of a day as exists minus the binge binging on Netflix. 
Yeah. Um, my normal morning routine is pretty well described in the book, Own the Day. So you, you stick it involves to the, still. Yeah, I do. It really involves the first thing is hydration, you know, making sure you lose a couple pounds of water overnight, especially if you're breathing through your mouth. I've started using mouth tape, which has actually made me less dehydrated in the morning because obviously you have a moist, wet inside of your body. And as you breathe out, uh, that moisture leaves the body and the air that you breathe in isn't as moist. So you're just kind of slowly letting out moisture throughout the night. Um, you can also sweat and whatever else might happen. Um, but so replenishing water is the first thing. And also we're not a freshwater organism. We're a saltwater organism. So making sure to add a couple grams of sea salt in the water. Sometimes a dash of lemon is really nice with that. So that's first thing in the morning. And then the next is get a little sunlight, get a little movement in. And that gets me kind of started and fired up. And I usually don't drink my first coffee till sometime around lunchtime. Mm -hmm. um, Cause I just get my body going with its natural rhythms before I start adding any stimulants. And uh, you know, when I have the opportunity, I'll, uh, I'll do a cold plunge. That's one of my favorite ways to start the day as well. Um, but all of those things, if I can get those things in, I'm going to be off, off to a great day. Yeah. The, uh, when you're traveling and super busy and, you know, schedule's really tight, do you try to still adhere to some semblance of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple. Even if I'm in a hotel room, I bring actually, so especially on the road, I'll use these, um, these packets called keen tones. It's with a Q Q U I N T O N. It's a particular concentrate of seawater. So it has the sea salt built in and I'll just use a packet of that squirt the packet in my mouth, then drink, you know, drink from my water bottle. I always have a water bottle with me and, um, and then get a little bit of movement in some way, you know, whether it's moving around, if my wife's up, I'll sometimes just wrestle her. If, uh, <laughs> if there's another thing, or sometimes, uh, sometimes sexy time, uh, <laughs> and then, uh, and then just, yeah, try to get my eyes get my eyes pointed towards the sun and get my skin in the sun. Yeah. Uh, if possible, that could be looking out the window or, or obviously much better is to go outside. Yeah. Um, from a, an eating standpoint, are you a don't eat until afternoon most days kind of guy? Yeah, most days, but I start with a, I start with a morning drink. Um, at least every time that I'm home and the morning drink has some organic cashew butter, some coconut butter, and and quite a bit of it and then some cacao uh four sigmatic cacao and turmeric and then a bit of protein like on it plant protein yeah and so i'll blend that up and it's a really kind of fatty drink um no caffeine other than what's in the cacao and um i'll start the day with that and then that usually gets me going till about lunchtime yeah eating wise when you actually do eat real food uh, or whole food um what what do you subscribe to a particular way of eating style of eating a, a certain few foods that you stick to? Yeah. You know, I, I try to keep my carbs to, uh, to the evening, you know, like, and obviously try to be mindful of what my glycogen depletion was like that day. Um, if I haven't been working out, then I'm going to have far less carbohydrate. Um, than if I have, uh, I tend to do better on higher protein, higher fat, uh, diets, vegetables. I have to be mindful. There's a lot of vegetables that are a hard no for me, like Brussels sprouts, hard, no cabbage, hard, no, like a lot of things that actually disturb my digestion, create inflammation. Um, but a lot of vegetables are great. Like I could eat the, I could eat zucchinis and celery and spinach for fucking days. Yeah. Um, was that a food sensitivity test that told you that or just through trying? No, there? it's just my, it's a fart sensitivity test. <laughs> yeah. You know, like eat Brussels sprouts and yeah. see how much gas you have a couple hours later. I mean, it's, yeah. they're just packed with prebiotic, prebiotic fiber. And yeah. my gut, I think because I was on a lot of courses of antibiotics for kind of recurrent strep throat when I was a teen, um, my gut just can't handle it. I mean, some yeah. people I suppose can, I still doubt, I don't know anybody who eats Brussels sprouts and doesn't fart. So yeah. I don't know. I think it's just like an idea of something that's good for you, but probably yeah. people shouldn't fucking be eating it. <laughs> they can be delicious, yeah. but yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm tracking. Um, when you originally grew up in uh, in California, can you kind of uh, synopsize what your childhood was like, as you recall? 
parents split when I was three. Um, so they weren't together that long. They were only together just basically enough time to have me and bring me into the world. Um, and you know, I had this kind of wild, my father was really wealthy. And so it was kind of the wild childhood at his Malibu manor. You could say as a fucking stunning place. And we had a bus and a trampoline room and a, you know, it, like indoor ski machine. And it was like, it was cr arcade. It was like, it was crazy. Right. And, and then with my mother, it was a lot more simple, you know, like some, like a little piece of kind of farm ranch land, you know, some horses and really kind of like really intimate kind of family life. And uh, so it was a good combination of both of yeah. this kind of pretty extravagant and very kind of cerebral connection that I had with my father and this really deeply loving connection that I had with my mother. And then I had three older stepbrothers who sufficiently tortured me and kicked my ass enough that I didn't turn out to be a little bitch like our CFO <laughs> that walked out at the, at the first sign of trouble. Yeah. Um, did you spend more time with one over the other? You know, I split the week pretty much down in half. So yeah. I would go over to my dad's on uh, on Thursday and come back either Saturday or Sunday. Um, yeah, and and that was it. Was uh, what was sports or any type of extracurricular activities um, an integral role in as you became an adolescent and early adult? Basketball. I mean, every sport really, like. My dad wasn't the greatest athlete, but he was fucking competitive. Yeah. And I saw him like he was, no matter what he was doing, like he was going full out, you yeah. know? And if he lost, he was just completely dejected. Yeah. And like, and so there was that massive competitiveness on that side. And then my mother was a professional tennis player, like semifinals of Wimbledon. Wow. So she was a legit athlete and, uh, and didn't take the trivial stuff so seriously. Cause once you've yeah. been to Wimbledon, then, yeah. you know, playing in the backyard doesn't really get your engine fired up quite as much, but, yeah, um, but so competition was huge. And so I was good at a lot of different things, but basketball quickly became my sport and it was my obsession, yeah. you know, and was able to get to, you know, first team, all, all region and preseason, all state, um, for my, for my school and, and big Texas basketball. So it was a big, it was a big, it was a big deal. You know, we'd get a couple thousand people out to our games every game. It was, it was a big deal. And, and yeah. it was, uh, it was quite a ride. I had a fucking terrible coach, so he was the worst. Um, <clears throat> so it kind of soured me on, on continuing with basketball. I was kind of like burnt out. I was like, fuck this, I'm done. Yeah. Um, but I still stayed as a competitive athlete in whatever way I could, yeah. uh, for as long as I could. I even played a basketball league this year, which was pretty fun. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so as you're graduating high school, where is your mind at long game wise at that point? <laughs> Interestingly, like I was still, I was thinking about, you know, I knew I wanted to be a writer. I, w I loved writing. I loved writing since I was a lot younger. <clears throat> so I knew I was going to write. Um, but really, I mean, I was just thinking about girls really like and this is not a this is not a theme that goes away either <laughs> yeah. like like this was this was uh this was my obsession i love women i really love them and not in the like womanizing i want to use them i need them to make myself feel a certain way like i like legitimately love them you know and and uh it's it's funny you know it's like so I had a My Little Pony collection when I was a <laughs> when I was a boy, yeah. and obviously I had the GI Joes and stuff too. But I don't think people understood why I loved the My Little Ponies. I loved them because they were beautiful, yeah. and I just loved like like having them and caring for them. And I like I love them. And it's yeah. like the same with with women. Like I love I love women. I always loved women. I was I was a poet. I was a romantic, and um and so that was a huge part of what I was really thinking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously I, I was terrible at it because I was far too obsessed with the idea of like, so I was only ever dating the woman, like the woman that I was my most normal self with because yeah. the ones that I really liked, I'd be like writing them poetry and they'd be like, <laughs> Whoa, too much, bro. Like fucking calm down. Yeah. Um, and then really a lot of, I knew that I had a lot to contribute to the world philosophically. I started my plant medicine journey. I had a lot to share. Um, so it was a combination of knowing that I had 
something big to do. And also knowing that I wanted to be such a great man that I could, you know, be with whichever woman I wanted to be with, that I could really make a choice. And that was, that was the driving force for a lot of it. It was the combination of knowing that I was here to impact the world in a significant way. And also knowing that impacting the world in a significant way would allow me the opportunity to be with the woman of my dreams yeah. and whatever, however it went down, it worked Yeah, because I was able, I've been able to do both. So, yeah. so talk about the, uh, the plant plant medicine journey a little bit. Is that kind of the first step after, uh, after coming to that realization that, uh, that you took? That was crazy. 18 years old. Um, just finished high school and <clears throat> I was pretty staunch atheist at that point. You know, I, I've been, I was reading books, philosophical books and a lot of things like early, you know, and I was a pretty avid atheist, partly because when I moved from California to Texas for my freshman year of high school, I got honey dicked into all kinds of church, <laughs> like church trips. You know, they're like, you yeah. want to go skiing? And I was like, yeah, I love skiing. Yeah. And then I'd go there and it was like fucking Bible study all yeah. night and, you know, skiing in the day. I was like, what the fuck are you guys talking about? Yeah. And stop telling me that all of my family and all the people I love are going to hell. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. I refuse. That is not true. And it's not fair. And I think it's bullshit. And so ultimately, <laughs> like, I got like angrier about the situation. Then I went to Italy and I went to uh, this museum called the Dungeon of the Inquisition. And it showed all of these obscene torture devices yeah. that were used on people who were quote heretics. Right. Yeah. And I was like, fuck this, like, this is evil shit. And so I was like really angry and I had no positive aspects of a spiritual basis other than, you know, some understanding of native American mythology and like a connection with nature, things like that. Um, so fast forward, I go and my father, lines me up to go with a traditional shaman and to do like a medicine vision quest, a psilocybin vision quest out of the mountains, of New Mexico. I was fucking terrified, like terrified. I remember grabbing a rock and I was like, as long as I hold on to this rock, I will know that I exist. <laughs> and, <a> uh, <laughs> it was a trip. And so, you know, again, it's 23 years ago and I go through this journey and I feel my body evaporate, completely evaporate. And this presence that I could call it consciousness, but I didn't really have that word. The only word that made sense to me because I was soul. I was like, oh my God, this is my soul. Like my soul is real. The unborn, the undying, the everlasting presence and awareness is real. And I was like, fuck, like I got to rethink this whole thing. You know, I have new data now and yeah. I have new data and I just stayed up all night writing feverishly in my journal around this fire, the coyotes were howling. And it was this wild, this wild night of me just kind of recapitulating my entire belief system. And that set me out on a quest to find out answers for myself. I still discarded the majority of religious teachings because I was like, uh, yeah, the bullshit that I saw is still bullshit. Yeah. But if they've been talking about a soul and I experienced something, that felt like my soul. Well, they at least got some part of it, right? You know, so maybe there's some more to learn if I go deeper. And surely, sure enough, you know, throughout my life, I found Christian mystic teachers. And, you know, I'm, I'm right now studying with a, a Hebrew Kabbalist, erotic mystic teacher. And I'm really learning that there was beautiful insights that were at the bottom of a lot of these teachings, but that those teachings have just been misunderstood and abused for, you know, excuses to build up organizations and have people step into power. So it's been an interesting journey. It's taken me through all the major plant medicines, ayahuasca, boga, wachuma, um, you name it. You know, I've been there. Have you done the, the Ibogaine, uh, trip, you know, that, that a lot of veterans have yep. you've done that. I, mm -hmm. I'm curious to get, I, take, but I just had a guest on a few, few weeks ago that, uh, kind of outlined in depth his experience with that. What is, what is your just, I guess, overall take with that, uh, that therapy? Yeah. The way that I did it was in the more traditional psycho spiritual sense than in the medical remediation of PTSD or remediation of addiction sense. And, but I can see how it's effective for both because 
I work with the traditional Bwiti shaman, and that's where it comes from. It comes from Gabon in Africa, and this is part of the initiation rituals of their tribe. Um, it's by far the most intense psychedelic. And this is not only experientially, but also if you look at the mechanism of action, it works on like four times the amount of receptor sites that something like psilocybin works on. So you're really hitting the brain and the body in, in, in a lot of different ways. You have an elevated heart rate and it lasts like 24 hours. Yeah. And it's fucking uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I mean, ayahuasca can be uncomfortable. Lots of things can be uncomfortable. Iboga is on another level. It feels like you have a fever, like you're stuck in like a high voltage microwave and you're fucking hot and your ears are buzzing and you that can't open awesome. your eyes and see straight. You're like relentlessly nauseous, but your mind is so clear. Like your mind is just so sharp That's and wild. so clear. You're able to just sort through <clears throat> all of your own delusions, all of the errors and thinking, all of the ways that you're trying to serve yourself, but missing the mark. So it's like really kind of like shaking your body. I liken it to being an ant on a tuning fork. Like you're just getting rattled from the inside out and all the old programs and patterns have a chance to leave and your mind can track all of them with super keen insight. Do you think that from a, a shelf life standpoint that it's effective in the long term? Because I've heard a lot of guys say that, that it was, it was life changing and awesome. I, I've not, not done it, but that, but it, it had a, an expiration date is it like it kind of only lasted for so long and it was months you know so it wasn't like yeah. just getting high and then the next day it's everything's the same but it but it still it wasn't like a, a lasting effect that uh that, that they took with them mm -hmm. infinitely yeah i think it's both i think that and it depends on who you are and what your diligence is with integrating what you've learned yeah <clears throat> so you pull somebody out of the ordinary world, you put them in this extraordinary world, these massive transformational changes happen. You put that person back in the same environment and eventually the environment seeps through and, and actually realigns the person to that new environment. But if you make changes to your environment through your own personal practices or through ways in which you've altered your friend group, you've altered the way that you interact with the world and you make those habits permanent, then it will be a permanent change. But you can't expect you to change in a separate environment and then go back to the same environment and the same habits and expect that change to stick. The environment is too strong. Yeah. You know, our culture is too strong. Our habits are too strong. So that's the key with integration. It's like, can you, can you go and have your experience and then put in habits that actually allow you to sustain that level of consciousness? So, it's, I mean, it sounds like it's almost like a, uh, an epigenetics button reset or reset button. Yeah, exactly. But, but if you, exactly. But really if you, well said. But if you go back to the same environment that epigenetically created the issues that you have, obviously it's going to override that and, and take you back to square one. Very well said. Uh, it's fascinating stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm very curious about it. I know a lot of guys that have tried it. Um, I've thought about it. I've had a lot of people say, oh, you should, you should give it a shot. But I've never really thought or felt like I needed it. And I know that that's not necessarily uh, a reason for not doing it. It's just, you know, I, I, I almost don't drink. I don't mess with any drugs. Like I, I don't feel stressed out or angry all the time. And it's, mm -hmm. and it seems like most of the guys that have said, you know, Hey, you should try this. It was life changing for me. Struggled with a lot of those things. You know, they were mm -hmm. angry at fucking everybody all the time. They're su super stressed out. They're alcoholics or they're on, opioids or, or whatever. And, and they were in dark places, super unsuccessful and, and whatever. And I, I was just like, you know, I, I'm pretty fucking happy with where I'm at, you know, like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not saying that it, it couldn't be beneficial, but I also know that it's a pretty serious fucking undertaking. Um, you know, and, and it's like, if, if I don't feel like shit, I need to make some changes or things aren't going to go well. Like, I, I just don't feel that way. You know, maybe, maybe I'm just being arrogant. I don't know. But, um, no, I don't think you're being arrogant. I think that's really reasonable. And I don't think you should do anything unless you're called to it, really. You know, yeah. I mean, I think you should really want to do it. Like it's it's too big of a it's too big of an undertaking to do out of simple curiosity. Yeah. However, I that being said, this is the way to test how good you are. Yeah. Right. Like I think a lot of people like they still have a little lack of faith that like maybe this this medicine is gonna change me in a way that I don't want to be changed. No, it's not like 
it's going to tap into your highest, your highest self, the best version of who you are. And so if you're good, it'll tell you, Hey, you're fucking good. Yeah. Good job. Like way to go. Like, it's not going to, it's not going to give you some bullshit. You know, it's not like a th <laughs> psychotherapist that needs to have you come back and, you know, make up a bunch of problems you have yeah. just so they can fix it. You yeah. know, it'll be like, no, you're doing great. Yeah. Like, good job. It, that's, that's literally the message that you'll get. So it is a great way to test and yeah. have this kind of like, well, am I doing good or am I, yeah. am I fooling myself? Yeah. You know, like, and, and it is a, it is a good way to be like, well, let's put it to the test. Yeah. Almost a, an affirmation exercise. Exactly. Exactly. Um, from a career path standpoint, once you, I mean, it sounds like it's been a lifelong thing, but at what point did you take all of those experiences that you had with the, you know, the plant medicine type journeys that you'd been on and, and decided, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this into the empire that is on it or, or did it not go that way? <clears throat> It was a little bit separate. I mean, I think a lot of the consciousness that I developed in my understanding of myself through all of these psychedelic medicines help, helped me to create the energy of the company, the culture of the company, the way that I treated other people, the way that, you know, I mean, we had some pretty revolutionary policies for its time. Like if somebody ordered something from us and they didn't like it, they didn't have to send it back. They just told us and we would give them their money back. Right. Like no games, no bullshit. It was just like, we're going to treat you. We're going to treat you legitimately really well. Yeah. And we're going to trust that that reciprocity is going to be there. So I think a lot <laughs> of that had, had something to do with on it. Of course, my, you know, psychedelic adventuring certainly helped exacerbate the friendship that I had with Joe Rogan, you know, gave us a lot of interesting things to talk about. He was, I mean, what is, what is on it without Joe Rogan? You know, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to say. I don't even know if it exists in the way that it did, yeah. um, without him, I'm forever grateful to, to being partners with him for those 11 years, yeah. uh, in a lot of ways, you know, I mean, the gratitude for that man is just, it's, it's gigantic, yeah. you know, just gigantic gratitude. Um, and of course, like, you know, like I said, the psychedelics were a point of connection that we had where we were both super interested in that. So there's a lot of ways it was there, but you know, running a business is still running a business, it's still uh, inspiration, ideation, and then creation and the blocking and tackling of actually getting it done. Yeah. Was, uh, was there a kind of almost an ethos or a, a mission statement that you had internally that drove you to, to do that kind of stuff? Like, was it, or I guess where, where was the idea to do it born or created out of you know i was so when i was growing up i mentioned my 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 parents split when i was three so my stepmother was a naturopathic doctor who worked with all of pat riley's basketball teams mm. so the la lakers showtime lakers <clears throat> in the 80s new york knicks in the 90s the heat in the 2000s you know d wade and Shaq and the whole the whole yeah. show you know one of the most legendary coaches of all time and so she worked with athletes. And so even in the, in the nineties where supplementation was questionable at best, I mean, you go to GNC, get some fucking stuff with like a shiny rhino on a label and it would just be filled with ephedra. <laughs> ephedra, and, yeah, white cross. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, uh, but intelligent supplementation didn't exist, but it did for, it did for her. So I remember having a paper towel napkin of, all of the supplements to take on game day and all of the supplements to take on test day. And they were different. So I learned that there was things that I could put in my body that would affect my performance. And I met other people, you know, my, the first investor in on it, my first kind of partner, you could say, but he was an investor put in $60,000 uh, to start. It was Bodie Miller. Mm. who was an Olympic skier. Yeah. Also hard partying, you know, high performing, uh, and we, we became like really, really close friends and he was into the same type of thing. I mean, he was doing ketogenic diets, like for, for spurts way before that was fucking popular. Like he was dialed in and same with Roger Huerta, the MMA fighter. Mm -hmm. Um, both of them were around at the Genesis of on it and they were both doing things in really unconventional ways. And I was also doing things in unconventional ways. Um, and so we all kind of just got into it. And then Rogan was super interested in kettlebells. 
so there's like this really kind of interesting energy of people who are doing things unconventionally that was just right at the genesis of, of when this got going. And so it was something that we were all really passionate about because we felt like we were on the forefront of a trend that was coming yeah. and you know, we were right. I mean, supplementation has gone to a whole other level. I think on it's had a, a part to play in that, but it's universally that way. Unconventional fitness, kettlebells and maces and sandbags and all and ropes and all this, that's gone to another level, you know, dietary decisions like ketogenic diets. I mean, we're way early in that trying to figuring that stuff out. So a lot of these trends have really come to fruition, but there was a lot of energy in the feeling like, Oh, we know some shit that's about to hit. And it hasn't hit yet, and yeah. we can make a big impact with it. Yeah, I mean it's a it's it's a neat genesis, as you put it, to to the start of that, and and seems like it it was supposed to be that way uh, to a certain extent. Um, yeah, is there? I don't know if you want to or are willing to share it or not, but is there a a methodology that you employ to create your products? Like, is it a this doesn't exist and it should, so let's make this, or is it? I'm struggling with X, so I'm going to make Y because that's what I want to fucking do. And if I, if I, the need latter, it, yeah, the latter, that's the same, same that shit was my, that I use that for was my, my dog products, but yeah, yeah, that was my secret. It was like, what do I want the most? And actually alpha brain, which is our flagship product, still our flagship product to this day. Um, that came from a conversation <clears> I had with Joe when I was like, Joe, man, like what product would you like the most? And he was like a kick-ass all natural nootropic, like a cognitive supplement. And I was like, okay. I'm going to go about making the best one that's ever been made. Yeah. And he just kind of smiled at me and he was like, all right, if I can go for it. And, yeah. uh, and we were able to do that. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Um, have there been any that, that have fr from your standpoint, just fallen flat that you're like, well, fuck that didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Lots of them. I mean, you know, what's funny is like, uh, we had, a. It's, I was thinking about this one recently. So I came out with, um, I came out with this brand of chocolate through the under the on it label called Choco Free. And it was sugar free chocolate that had like functional, functional supplements like medicinal mushrooms and shit in it. And we came out with that in like 2014. And it fucking bombed. Yeah, it bombed. And, uh, and I go look around the market now and this shit is everywhere. <laughs> Similar names. There's companies like chalk zero and yeah. all of these things. And Lily's obviously is huge. And I was like, God damn, we were just like a little bit early. Didn't have enough stick to itiveness. Like, yeah. you know, weren't, weren't quite there. And then in, in other cases, we were a little bit late. Like we had some reticence about coming out with the CBD product. So we came out a little bit late with that. The market was already flooded. I was too late. Um, you know, exogenous ketones, we couldn't quite get that formula right, you know, and it, we were a little bit late there. So, so I've been early, I've been late and sometimes I've just been, you know, sometimes I've just been wrong, you yeah. know, not necessarily wrong, but it just wasn't something that was ever going to take off. Like I had this fulvic mineral drink and, um, it, it like, it was good, but nobody, still nobody really cares. I mean, they do a little bit, you see fulvic minerals and you know, there's like black water that has some in it and you, you see it there, but there's some things that the market was just like, not that interested in. Yeah. The, uh, exogenic ketones thing from your perspective, has anybody really nailed that? <clears throat> yes. Um, I'm not asking you to plug a yes. competitor, but, uh, no, it, they, they haven't really, they haven't really launched. And this is, uh, <clears throat> this was, <laughs> So I don't know if, I don't know if on it is going to, is going to pursue this or not, but there's a, um, there's a lab and a developer who's developed, uh, an exogenous ketones product that the problem with exogenous ketones is it actually shunts your own endogenous production. So it's if like you just take it normally, just like, just like a testosterone, right? Like you take it in and then it prevents the body from producing, you know, this one actually is more like, a more like a combination, if you want to use this hormone, uh, hormone example, more like um, testosterone or maybe like HCG or something, something that stimulates the body's own production yeah. of this. So they found a way that they could make an exogenous ketone that not only provides exogenous ketone, but also stimulates the body's endogenous production of ketones and the utilization of fat, uh, fat for fuel. And when I take that one, 
it feels pretty damn good. Yeah. Um, so that one's good. There's another product called Keto Before Six, which is uh, which is my other favorite product. It's, it tastes kind of like um, it tastes like what leaks out of RoboCop when he gets wounded. <laughs> but you know what that tastes like? <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like cinnamon and yeah. castor oil. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I'm. The one thing about that type of supplement that seems almost like a too good to be true kind of thing, and maybe that's why so many ha haven't been able to dial it in because it shuts your ability to produce it. But um, from a benefit standpoint, I mean, it, it, it's almost like a, a fucking cheat code for a gaming system almost, right? I mean, the, the way I understand yeah. it. Um, yeah. I mean, is there a downside to the, to the ones that are dialing it in the way that you're talking about? No. It seems hard to believe really. almost, you know, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's only going to be helpful. Yeah. And, and actually, I think when you start looking at the things that are like the most important, there's so much talk about your immune system and your cardiac health and everything, everything's trying to get siphoned into one thing or another, but it's like, how much life force energy can you fucking produce? Yeah. Right. Like you, the rate limiting factor of your body to do awesome shit is how much life force energy. So how much are you leaking through stress? Are you recovering yourself with sleep? Are you polluting your system? You know, are you giving yourself enough energy to really do the shit that your body knows how to do? And ketones are a way to just give yourself an alternate fuel source. Yeah. You know, it's like adding some, it's like a hybrid engine. You know, you got your gasoline, call that your, your carbohydrates, your glycogen, and then you got your electric, which is the ketones. Yeah. And, when you can be a dual, when you can be a dual engine, you're just going to have more life force to do whatever you need to do. And, you know, look, I, I do a lot of good things, um, to help myself out and it's really paying off. But as soon as I started really paying attention to like my energy levels, that's been probably the biggest lift to my health of, of anything. Cause you know, right now, um, my wife is sick in bed with COVID my, another person who is you know, staying with us, she's sick with COVID. And then another person staying with it has influenza A. Yeah. And I'm just like, I'm just dancing <laughs> through the raindrops and I'm not saying I'm going to make it through this whole thing, but nonetheless, yeah. I've, I've made it through a lot of these situations just because I'm just continually paying attention to yeah. just how much life force energy yeah. I can, uh, I can generate. Yeah. Is, is there a product that, that you haven't developed yet that you want to, that you can talk about, or is that, uh, is that corporate? <sighs> Yeah, I mean that's probably uh, that's probably still in the black box. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Still in the black box, but we have new shit coming out all the time. Yeah, uh, you know I'm interested. You know what I'm interested in? It's separate, separate thing than on it. I'm interested <laughs> in uh, functional alcohol. Hmm. That's what I'm interested in. Like uh, and a, a dual purpose alcohol right. drink. So, right. so in essence, the in piggybacking on the vodka Red Bull of the '90s. Right. But actually, well, that one, you know, yeah, but something that's like a lot better for you. But yeah. that's the idea, right? Yeah. It's like, oh, you want energy and intoxication. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's figure out, like, trying to figure out, all right, like, what can we do with alcohol yeah. that we did with supplementation? Like, we know that we're going to get the alcohol ride. What else can we do? Yeah. What else can we do to make that interesting yeah. from both a functional and a health perspective? So I'm working on some stuff like that. Yeah. Is, uh, is one of the principal goals with that is something to alleviate the, the toxicity of it or or is that that's, just that's one of the ideas yeah you know, i mean to me that like long game wise that seems like that's the biggest drawback mm -hmm. of it is that it, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're slightly poisoning yourself you know over and over but do you, do you drink much now i don't drink much um here's the thing i would probably drink more but alcohol Alcohol only works in the way that I want it to for me, like less than 50% of the time. Really? Which like, is? So the, what I want it to do is I want to feel that kind of fucking euphoria and that kind of like, God, this feels good, yeah. you know? And I, I know that like one, one thing for sure, I have to be fasted. Like yeah. If I start drinking after I eat, it doesn't work. Yeah. I just start to feel like a little tired and like a little kind of inflamed and it doesn't fucking work. So. Yeah. I have to get my drinking in before my food yeah, <clears throat> or like way after my food. Um, different things have different effects, you know, like beer, like a, if I have like a beer on an empty stomach, you know, like 
it actually gives me a really good buzz. Yeah. But then I also like can sometimes start not feel that good the next day if I'm drinking beer. Yeah. Like for whatever reason. So, and then sake is probably the best. It's probably my best buzz. So I'll drink some sake. I can also have a little bit of sushi with the sake too. That's one of the ones that actually works. Yeah. Uh, wine is a lot of fun, but doesn't really make me feel that good all that often. Um, and then the liquors, <clears throat> tequila, whiskey, you know, um, a really good cognac, you know, those can be really good too. But again, it's, uh, I usually get one or two good drinks in and then that's kind of the sweet spot where anything more, I just yeah. feel worse. Yeah. I mean, t to me, the, it sounds like, like that. And I agree. Like I feel kind of a similar empty stomach. If it's like a strong IPA, like one or two of those is, yeah. is, a, is an awesome feeling. But similarly, like it, whether it's the, the filler gluten, I mean, whatever the fuck is in it that, uh, you know, yeah. th that your body probably just isn't supposed to tolerate that well, uh, always creeps mm -hmm. up and it's that way really with all alcohol for me. But, yep. um, I'm curious on the, on the psychedelic or any type of narcotics that, that you would consider uh, natural. Is there one that, that you have experimented with that from that euphoria standpoint mimics or uh, has the ability to replace uh, that, that opiate type of euphoria that, that seems to plague so many fucking people? So some interesting ones to look at. And again, this is not me recommending anything. <laughs> Make your own fucking decisions. Be your own. I'll stamp Don't of blame. approval. <laughs> don't blame me if you if you become a fucking hooligan like me um ultimately i think one thing worth experimenting with again that sounds like a recommendation one thing that i like to experiment with is uh is kratom yeah it's k-r-a-t-o-m kratom and that creates this interesting euphoria you have to get the dosing right because too much makes you sleepy and nauseous but the right amount will make you talkative and euphoric yeah i love i love experimenting with kratom isn't there um, like a ton of different types of it yep yeah so yeah. that's part of so the puzzle i like uh the so my friend kyle kingsbury uh ufc fighter he likes this kind of uh red super speciosa brand blend that that was really good i i tend to go with like a white mang da is what i is the blend that i'll use but there's a lot of different types um and they have kind of different different feelings that are yeah. subtle um, but I think Kratom is worth, <clears throat> is worth taking a good look at, you know, this is again, now I'm venturing farther into the territory of this is illegal and I don't, I can't recommend it, but, uh, if you're using GHB sensibly for yourself, it tends to, you know, have a better kind of metabolic, uh, experience than alcohol you know, from, you get the same kind of, um, so alcohol is a GABA agonist and increases the amount of GABA in your brain and GHB does as well. Um, but it's just, the process is a little bit cleaner. However, this is like, it's highly, highly dangerous really? because if you take too much, if you take too much, you will pass out, you will throw up, you will not be able to be woken up. You'll have to ride it out. So again, super strong cautionary message. Yeah. But if you know how to, if you know how to use it, it's the only thing that actually mimics alcohol in drug form. Um, but again, absolutely not a recommendation and be super, super fucking careful yeah. if you start to try and play with this dragon, like it's a fucking dragon and it will eat you and it will, it will, it can really hurt people. Yeah. So be very careful with that. But if you do it right, you know, it can be, it can be something that's interesting to look at. Um, another interesting one to look at is there's been obviously a lot of, a lot of kind of talk about MDMA and, uh, MDMA is great. And I think it's great in the therapeutic context. It can also be a lot of fun, but there's a pretty sharp crash that comes on the backside of that. If you're using it recreationally. And again, I'm not recommending using it recreationally, like allow it is not a recommendation. I, I will say that for the final time, yeah. but, uh, but, so that's something that I've kind of veered away from in my, in my later years, but there's, um, there's another format of that called MDA. It's called, uh, also known as sassafras, a little bit harder to get. That is kind of a longer ride and this kind of gentler, gentler roller coaster. Um, but is really, really nice as well. 
Is that something so that that's one's... purely illicit? Like you're only going to find that from your local heroin dealer kind of stuff? Or <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, I think that one, if it's if it's concentrated like that, it is outlawed. I think sassafras you can actually get because it's they actually used to use that in root beer. Um, like, so, so with, with MDA, and, like there's not a, a prescription form of it or a, a no, synthetic. No, not at this point, yeah. not a prescription form. And then, but what there is a prescription form, uh, <clears throat> of is ketamine. So ketamine would be the only other one that I would mention. And look, I've just kind of been really honest with the stuff that I fuck with. Yeah. Um, if I'm going to fuck with anything and, and like, this is kind of like my burn, if I'm going to Burning Man, you know, I'm probably going to try and make sure I have <laughs> access to, uh, to these things. Yeah. Um, and you know, ketamine is another one. And I think obviously great for spiritual journeys, great for alleviating depression. You can get a prescription of it. You have to be mindful. It can be addictive. If you like to escape, you can use this to escape. All of these things can have a real, have a real downside, uh, especially the GHB that, that has probably the biggest risk yeah. out of all of these but um so be super mindful if you're going to play in these fields yeah and obviously these are my re these are my you were talking about things that i do for fun so alcohol kratom ketamine ghb sassafras that's kind of rounds it out every once in a while a little bit of cannabis usually makes me more kind of anxious than it does feel good yeah um and that's and that's pretty much it and then there's the medicines category you know wachuma boga ayahuasca those you don't do recreationally. Yeah. Those are, you know, with, with deep reverence for the traditions that carried them and, uh, and for a really clear purpose. Yeah. That makes good sense. Um, from a, a business standpoint, I guess, just, uh, in, in hearing mm -hmm. you talk about all that, is there a, and I don't know if you're set up this way or not, but is there a shareholder holding their breath? Like, fuck, why are you talking about this kind of stuff being the, being the face of the company? <laughs> like, is that a concern or you're like, it's fucking my company and kiss my ass. You know, I, you know, I sold the company. So at this point, at this point, uh, and I'm don't have any other, I mean, they could drop me as a sponsor, yeah. but I think they're pretty used to me saying whatever the fuck I'm going to say, yeah. you know, it's kind of my commitment to tell the truth. Yeah. And, you know, I try to tell it in a reasonable way, you know, it's like, you, I want to, I don't, I don't think the idea of not talking about stuff really works, you know, yeah. like, yeah, GHB feels really <clears throat> good, but it's fucking dangerous. Yeah. And, you know, like I know people have wound up in the hospital. I know people who've known people who've died. Like it's, it's fucking really dangerous, yeah. but if done in the right way, yeah, it can feel good. But I'd rather tell that story than be like, oh, you know, I keep it pretty chill, maybe a little <laughs> tobacco here and there yeah. and, you know, and just have a beer or so and just yeah. lie. Like, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Like, I've been down these roads. I know what the fuck is up. Yeah. You know, I've never done heroin. I think <clears throat> cocaine is a terrible, terrible fucking drug. It's, I think it's like the most ridiculous drug. Maybe I've never had good cocaine, but it makes you feel cool for like five fucking minutes and then you reevaluate your life for the next 24 hours. Like, <laughs> I don't get it. Yeah. Like, I just don't get it as a drug. Yeah. Um, but you know, so I'd rather tell the full story and, and let people know yeah. than not talk about it and, uh, and let people figure it out for themselves. Yeah. What would, so for like prescription opioids being compared to some of the things that from a recreational standpoint that, uh, that you prefer or enjoy, how would you compare them? I guess, I mean, is there a reason that, uh, uh, like a physical or health reason why you don't use those in, instead of, of what you use or. Well, I mean, kratom is, kratom is kind of like an opioid surrogate in a way. It, it, it acts on similar receptors just in a different way. Um, the actual, like, actual painkillers and opioids, I think I just have a lot of respect for their addictive potential. Yeah. You know, and I, I think even though I don't have an addictive personality, I have a lot of respect for that. Also, I, I got really sick from Tylenol, just regular Tylenol. I got, um, like acute liver failure from, from that Tylenol, oh, I got sure. jaundice and the whole thing. Cause I, I didn't realize that my sinus medicine had Tylenol in it and I was taking separate. So I was taking like double mm. Tylenol. Yeah. Um, and I got really fucking sick. God damn. How much were and you taking? So, I mean, was it like probably, probably like, I don't even know. I mean, I was taking a full dose of Tylenol. So whatever, whatever that was at the time, whether that was 325 or more, 
Um, and then another dose every kind of two hours. Cause I was on a four hour <laughs> schedule, cold medicine every four hours, Tylenol every four hours. Yeah. So that was kind of where, it, that's kind of where it ended up. Um, it's not that I haven't taken painkillers and been like, oh, this feels pretty good. And like when I got my car accident and whatever, but the, I really don't like the Tylenol aspect. If I, if, <laughs> if there was, if there was like a, if I had like a little bit of like opium to smoke or something like that, yeah. and I had it around my house, like, I wonder, I wonder if I wouldn't load up a pipe every now and then and get a puff. Yeah, I'm Maybe I would. Yeah, I'm surprised. You know? I'm surprised at this point with like the vape and dab pens and, and all that shit that exists. That and maybe there is. Um, I admittedly that like this whole realm of of trying shit like that is not is you know, just me being honest the same way as you. It's just not something I fuck with or, or haven't. A lot of it is mm -hmm. just a lack of of education on it. But uh, but the it seems like if you could have a like a straight opium based oil that you put into you know pens like that. Wouldn't that be kind of the best mix of everything? I think so. You know, I, again, I just have like a deep respect for like if people like when they put so they they wired up monkeys. I think it was John Lilly that did this. They wired up monkeys with brain electrodes and the brain electrodes were hooked to the orgasm button in their in their brain. Really? Right. The brain, the, the part that triggered the sensation of orgasm. Yeah. And they gave the monkeys the button and the monkeys, the monkeys just pressed the button all day yeah. until they needed bananas to refuel. Like they weren't sleeping. They weren't doing anything but pressing the orgasm button. Yeah. And so I wonder, you know, I just released a podcast with Dr. Carl Hart and he makes a pretty, he makes a pretty compelling case. He's a, he's a user of most recreational drugs. He makes a pretty compelling case for the legalization of all drugs. Yeah. But, I wonder if we're mature enough, Yeah, you know, if we're really mature enough to handle it, or we're going to be like, if we had an opium vape pen, are we going to be like the orgasm monkey yeah. that's just hitting the vape pen and, you know, allowing our lives to go to ruin? I don't know. I don't know if certain drugs might be too, too seductive yeah. to, <laughs> to be, yeah. to be legal. And, uh, and so I have a lot of respect for the opium yeah. category and I think Kratom, I'm, I'm a lot more comfortable yeah. with. I mean, I think that's a, a pretty mature take on it. I, I, you know, my, my perspective is that I think you already kind of see the people that, that if, if that would, would do that to them, there's already something that's filling that void for them. What, whatever that's it is. What, that, that's what, that's what Carl Hart would say. Yeah, I mean, you whether know, it's, it's gaming like or porn is... or uh, fucking alcohol, yep. I mean, whatever is that the type of person that, that doesn't have the, the constitution to, to say, you know what, no, I need to need to exercise a little impulse control here and, and need to go down this path. Like those people, I think inherently do that irrespective of what's available. Cause it's not like there's a shortage of things that are available to, to fuck your life up at this point. I think adding one is kind of like looking at uh, whether you, you use guns or, or uh, let's say a, a table of operating tools. Like it's, it's one more thing on that table of, of mm -hmm. tools to screw yourself over with. But uh not that, not that I think we need any more necessarily, but it's interesting. I, I, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, uh, I think in a very, in a mature world, yeah, we all have the right to make the choices and the sovereignty of our own consciousness as possible yeah. in a world that's driven by <clears throat> manipulation and commerce. I think it's really dangerous yeah. to make something like that illegal, you know, because I think somehow some advertisement and some firm would make it appear that this is something that's helpful for your life or whatever. Yeah. And so just yeah. fucking trick, trick us. Yeah. So there's, I think a lot of trust that needs to be built yeah. between people and the market and authority. And right now we're in a world where there's not a lot of trust yeah. and, uh, and that's for good reason yeah. that there's not a lot of trust because there's not a lot of trustworthy people telling us what to do. Absolutely. Uh, I know we're running short on time. I have a bunch of other shit listed. So if we can do kind of a, a wrap up uh, lightning round, where it's just a, it. a quick, uh, quick answer. Uh, favorite physical activity in terms of feeling alive. Sex. Sex. Amen. Uh, <laughs> do you have any any hobbies? Sex, like cars, bikes, fucking <laughs> ra racing, mountain climbing, whatever. Any any hobbies that yeah. are kind of outside what people know by a lot. I mean, I love any form of competition. I've really gotten into kendo stick. You know, kendo sword fighting. Of you know, I have axe throwing pickleball, basketball, um, 
I love just training in general, um, writing, you know, I write, I write stuff for myself that I don't ever publish. I just enjoy po whether it's poetry or fiction or yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you into cars and motorcycles at all? Not really. I mean, I see a good classic car and it's like, I think like, man, that's sexy. And I want to, I want to like get into it, but I don't have that kind of mechanical impulse. <laughs> and also I get really annoyed when I have to continually repair things that I don't know how to repair myself. Yeah. So it seems like a little too much. Yeah. Um, crypto NFTs, a fan interested, like them, don't like them. <laughs> I think NFTs are really a lot more about utility than they are going to be about art. I think this first wave of NFTs as art is a little bit silly, but I think NFTs as utility as a way to denote ownership of a thing yeah. is really important. I think crypto is also going to be the basis of, <clears throat> you know, I really believe in the kind of web 3.0 jargon. Like this is the, this is the medium upon which our future digital lives will be built uh, in the non tyrannical fucking vaccine passport yeah. world that is also another dystopia that's possible but in the other alternate reality i think crypto is a, a beautiful solution i'm terrible at timing my investments in there i'm like <laughs> i'm like the worst so yeah. i'll let people know what i'm doing and then you can do the opposite and that'll probably serve you really well yeah uh, do you have any interest in cryo freezing uh like while i'm alive like, sure what? it feels great but i think cold plunging is better but at the end no I, I put send my body send my body back to mama. I, I'll yeah. I'll be back another in another way yeah. in another time. Yeah. I've done enough damage to this one. I don't need to preserve it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, on in that same vein, um, well, so I mean that makes me think that you're probably uh, fond of or believe in uh, reincarnation to a certain extent. I know that that's a reality. I got you. I mean i i don't I don't expect I don't expect anybody to take my word for it. Yeah. But I've seen I've seen that in my own visions and my own yeah. understanding as I've gone beyond the veil through with all my <clears throat> psychedelic use, I know that that's a reality. Yeah. So, so it's not, not a question to me. Yeah. It's, it's not a belief in it. It's not a belief in it's like when somebody asked Carl Jung, like Dr. Jung, do you believe in God? And he just kind of laughs and he goes, I know God. Yeah. It's like, there's a difference between belief and, and knowledge. Yeah. And, and for me, again, I don't expect you to take my word for it, but I know, it. I know that we yeah. have many lives. Yeah. No, I can respect that. Um, one of the things that, that you hear about uh, from an eternal life or anti-aging standpoint is the notion or prospect that soon we will get to a point where you can essentially download your fucking brain into something and transfer it into a new a new body, essentially giving people the, the ability to, to sort of live forever. What is your take on that? I think it's missing the point that that's what happens already. Yeah. And it's happening in a perfect way. Like so we've already, like we as, yeah, we as a collective, as the collective divine have already organized the game that way. Yeah. And you don't want to continue your bad habits and your yeah. shitty ways of thinking and all of the entrainment that you have. Let that shit go. Yeah. Fucking start fresh. You know, it'll be fucking great. Yeah. <laughs> like, like relax everybody. You yeah. live forever anyways. Yeah. Like calm down. <clears throat> yeah. I love it. Uh, do you drink any type of like shitty soda, like fucking diet Coke, any of that kind of stuff? <laughs> Uh, no, yeah. I don't actually. That's one thing that I like. It's one vice that I don't have. It, like if I'm going to have an energy thing, I'll, I'll drink a highball, like a sugar-free highball, which is really clean. Yeah. Um, drink a lot of spin drift, which is also really clean. Um, but if you want to talk about like something that I do, that's a vice fried shit. Yeah. Like fried. What's shit. your favorite fried thing? Fried chicken. Yeah. From, from somewhere homemade or what? There's a lot of places. Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, there, I have a pretty, I have a pretty wide range of chicken tenders that I'll consider, <laughs> I'll consider delicious. You're not so. getting a frozen bag of Tyson nuggets from Walmart, though. No, right? no, getting not those chip. cardboard yeah. gray ass nuggets. Yeah. Uh, final question: What is the biggest fail that uh, that most people fall victim to uh, in their lives? The biggest fail that most people fall victim to is looking forward to a future point in time where they're going to be happy. That time <clears throat> is never going to arrive. The time is now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fucking now. And the more you look forward to that point and that success level and that time when you're going to be happy, 
the more it's just going to elude you. Yeah. Like start claiming your own joy now, no matter how hard you have to work, no matter what you do, allow yourself to be happy yeah. in this moment. Yeah. Uh, do you have a dog or dogs? I have two cats, two cats, two Savannah, two wild Savannah yeah. cats. Yeah. For me, so I, I train dogs for a living. I'm in the dog industry, products training, et cetera. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to me that like when people ask me what's your favorite thing about them, it, it's that same thing is that, you know, dogs, they're, yep. they don't think in a language, right? Their mind is A plus B equals C for everything. And so, you know, we could all uh, take a page out of their book in terms of being present. And uh, my, my favorite joke as we wrap up is, if you want to find out who loves you more, your wife or your dog, lock both of them in the trunk for two hours and you come back, pop the trunk, who's happier to see you? <laughs> uh, you know, but uh, all, yeah. all jokes aside, it's true. Like the dog's going to be like, bro, fucking A, man, where you been? Like, happy to see your wife. Oh, yeah, slap the shit exactly. out of you. But they're, they're masters exactly. at that. You know, they live right fucking now and, uh, and they're amazing that way. But full, full presence, yeah, yep. full presence in the moment. Well, it's a fascinating conversation. One of my favorite, uh, unquestionably. I, I can't thank you enough for taking the time. Um, it's been amazing. We, we could, I could spend four hours uh, asking you more questions, but I know you got to wrap it up. So uh, I sure appreciate you taking the time, and uh, and I hope to have you on uh, again at some point if uh, if that works for your schedule. But um, yeah, absolutely, brother. Yeah. This is great. Yeah, thank you much uh, for the listener out there. Appreciate your support. Don't forget to choke yourself. And uh, until next time, this is Mike Drop. <laughs>